is Peter Hudson. I'm the director of the Centre for Palliative Care. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, this is our centre's first forum of this kind, and we've been overwhelmed by the interest in this event. So can I say first and foremost, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. It's greatly appreciated. Just for our uh, presenters and for the panel to get a sense of the audience, I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind putting up your hand if you are not a healthcare professional. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome everybody. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Kulin Nations, and pay respect to their elders past and present. So why are we holding this forum? Well, death, dying, and responding to the impact of advanced disease are topics that are typically not openly discussed in Australian society. Death is commonly seen as medical failure rather than a re reality of life. Some people's perceptions of what it means to live with and or die from advanced disease are informed by television rather than human interaction. Furthermore, many people do not understand what palliative care is, uh, when it can be provided, and the benefits that it can offer. Therefore, our intent this evening is to raise your awareness and promote discussion about death, dying, and palliative care. In doing so, our hope is that you can be better informed and therefore more aware of the choices you have and the significant support that palliative care can provide. So I sincerely hope you find the, the evening beneficial. I'd now like to ask Dr. Gail Jennings to the stage. Gail is an award-winning uh, journalist uh, and TV presenter of some 25 years and has kindly and somewhat bravely uh, agreed to be our MC this evening. Please make her feel welcome. Thank you, Peter, and welcome, everybody. Very brave of you to come out in this hideous heat. It's supposed to be the worst possible thing for us, so I hope you've got lots of water. And if you're hot, it's much cooler down here, so you can all come down should you want. Um, welcome to this, the first public forum of the Centre for Palliative Care at St Vincent's Hospital. The Centre's hosting this forum because it wants to start a mini revolution about palliative care. No, Peter's dying now. No, it's actually because they want to start a public conversation about the state of palliative care in Australia, about which there's much to say. And why? Because research, research shows that the majority of Australians actually think that palliative care is about that time when you have an incurable disease, there's nothing left to do, so you're made comfortable till you die. And that's not what it is. It's not about death. Palliative care is about life. It's about the best possible care for people who are having a long life still, days, months, years, before their life finishes. Australians are now, uh, more than they were before, um, living and dying from, living with and dying from chronic diseases. They die of them in their old age, but they live with them for many years before. Diseases like dementia, uh, multiple sclerosis, chronic heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, Parkinson's and so on. So, these diseases are life limiting, but there's a long, long time before you get to the end of your life. And those years are very, very precious and they need to be the best they possibly can. We all need a good life until the very end. But right now, people are not necessarily getting the best life until the very end here in Australia. A raft of inquiries and reports, including the recent Auditor General's report and a Senate inquiry, has found that what people want and what they actually get can be very different things. What people largely get at that precious final part of their life, that stage of their life, is a disconnected, confusing and distressing array of services and interventions and relationships with health professionals. What they want is to be with their family and friends the vast majority of Australians, over two-thirds of them, would prefer to die at home, yet only 14% do. The place they most don't want to die is in residential care, and about a third of them do die in residential care, and over 50% die in hospitals. What people want is end-of-life discussions and advanced care plans, 
They want their symptoms to be well managed and they want personal, social and psychological support to be able to choose where and how to live with comfort, dignity and freedom, free from preventable pain, just like the rest of us live. And all of that is more likely to lead to a good death. So how do we change things if there's a gap between what people are experiencing and what they must have to have a better life till the end? And that's what this forum is about. It's about this starting to change, the information we need to have the conversation to lead to a better end of life. Tonight you're going to hear from a range of experts, researchers, doctors, nurses, social workers and carers. You're going to hear profoundly personal stories and you're going to hear cold hard clinical data. We have two talks, one short and one longer, a panel discussion which will include questions from the floor from all of you, finishing at eight o'clock and followed by refreshments. Now before I start, uh, I should make clear that tonight's forum is not about euthanasia. Euthanasia is a vitally important end of life issue and it's a very big topic that's being debated in a number of public and private arenas right now, including on the television, on radio, Andrew Denton's documentary and a current Victorian Parliament's end of life choices inquiry. There are many places where this is being discussed, but euthanasia is not the focus of tonight's forum. And if you mistakenly thought it was, you're very welcome to duck out. We're not going to take any offence at that. This particular forum has been designed to, car designed to carve out some space and time for a lesser known but equally vital issue, which is how to provide the best life possible for those requiring palliative care. So before I start formal proceedings, so just a little bit of housekeeping. The toilets, of course, the most important thing, are annoyingly up the stairs, out the door, and then to the left. Uh, if there's an emergency, just wait for our staff to tell you what to do, and there are many of them. There is filming. You can see Colin over there with the camera. He's only going to be filming the stage, so you don't have to um, put your lipstick on or duck. And um, I know I don't have to ask you this, but mobile phones, you are going to hold them up now and turn them off? That would be really good. And that includes the panellists and the guest speakers who are often the worst. All right, so let's start at the very beginning and at the very core, the patient. Here is Marmaduke's story. When you realise how uncertain life is, you do begin to appreciate the value of, of family and friendships and enjoy those moments while you have them because you don't know what's around the corner. So at 15 months he was diagnosed with childhood cancer and I basically became a full-time carer from then on. We went into hospital um, and after repeated you know, scans and ultrasounds had to put him through uh, chemo because the tumour basically was in his, um, growing out of his left kidney, out of the adrenal gland, but the, it was also wrapped, some legs had wrapped around the IVC which is the major blood supply up to the heart. So. Um, surgery wasn't an easy issue, so they had to put him on chemo for sort of three to four cycles. They then had some surgery, removed everything, and ultimately ended up with what they'd call um, sledgehammer chemo, which is very, very strong chemo. And then after 10 months, and it was a, a full-on 10 months, I think three out of every four weeks, um, I was in the hospital with him. He actually came through and he was declared clear. We waited three months to let him recuperate, then we took a big family holiday uh, up to Byron Bay. That's when my wife found a lump on her breast, so we came back to Melbourne. Um, she had a mastectomy and went straight on to chemo. And four days before she finished, Marmaduke relapsed. And by this time, his tumour had eaten most of the bone and he basically fractured his leg, which is how we found it. He then ended up racing into hospital and we probably didn't quite realise just how serious a, a relapsed neuroblastoma can be. Uh, they said we're going to be close to changing the conversation. So at the moment we're looking for a cure. We're still looking for a cure. But if the next cycle doesn't really have an impact, then the conversation will change and we'll really be looking at management, which meant that he would be terminal. Around that same time, um, although Milsom had finished her treatment, three months after her treatment, she relapsed big time and almost died. 
We effectively at that stage decided, well then let's live in the moment. We brought him home and he spent four or five months having a fantastic time with his brothers. We had a marvellous time. We even took him bush camping and had them all out in the water and it was just a, a priceless time. We knew that we couldn't cure him. We didn't know what the sentence was, was going to be. We didn't know, no one could actually say whether it would be four months, three months, a year. We just tried to enjoy each day and enjoy the moment, which is why the end of his journey to have him at home in his own bedroom with all his own colours, his own toys, his own sounds, have his, have his brothers climbing in and out of his bed. Um, it was as normal an environment as he could possibly have and it was, it was critical. Then probably, I'd say about two months before he died, things literally started crashing. I think that's when also my wife started crashing and I think that's when I say, the hut started sliding slowly off the mountainside. It was just like it all started going then. Milson was at home. The only way I could get Marmaduke at home, because I couldn't, I couldn't be in the hospital when Milson was sick at home, was to get him home with palliative care. So that also meant that he could come home, he could go in a, a big sort of recliner with a, an inflatable mattress underneath, and he could get wheeled into the lounge, and he can sit there with his brothers watching a DVD or playing games, and that was extraordinary, because it gave him freedom. Now, palliative care is often about, it's just comfort. So the pain relief in terms of the quality of life is absolutely critical. To be able to offer that sort of pain relief at home and almost allow him to lead a normal life with his family um, with incredible drugs going into him. Um, invariably the nurses would say he had enough going into him to bring down an elephant and yet they were amazed that he was not just conscious but lucid. If he'd been in hospital with limited pain medication, um, the discomfort would have been horrendous and undoubtedly his life would have been shorter, I would imagine, because the pain and the stress um, would have had quite a debilitating effect on him. That's why it was so important with palliative care that we had the opportunity to bring him home. So literally he was then at home with family. So his brothers knew exactly where he was in the house and his sister literally Charlotte curled up in bed with him every day for four to five weeks. I connected with him most of his life, but really intimately in his last final weeks. It was just almost natural for me to, I guess, just be with him every second I could. It was important for us to just remain positive. The reality is that you, you know how it's going to end. Um, but you need to embrace each day um, as well as you can and as calmly and cheerfully as you can for the family, but also for Marmaduke. He knew that he was loved every second of the day. There wouldn't be five minutes that would go by without someone interacting with him. I think what that also gave was constant um, touch and comfort, which I think is something not to be underestimated as someone's um, ending their life. When Milson died, it, it, she she always thought the wheels would wobble, but they literally just fell off. So it was quite a, quite a crash when it happened. And with Marmaduke, um, having him home for those five weeks, we'd had just so extraordinary days. Sounds a bit odd to say this, but this is the most beautiful time. And it was, it was, a, it was sharing, sharing that journey. One thing that seems clear to me is, it, it, yes, death's a mystery, but it's actually part of life. It definitely puts things into perspective. It also puts, um, it makes authentic relationships with the people around you a lot more significant. I think the only way you can um, deal with severe hardships is through connection with others. I've found that in grief, um, instinctively gratitude is an easier path for me than loss. Um, with gratitude, I'm grateful for what I had. So I celebrate their lives and their memories and it makes, it, it, it values them in a sense so that I can, I can think of them and I think of the wonderful times we had together, the times we shared. So yes, it was a short journey, but it was so rich and, and that, there's plenty to celebrate and, and I, I thrive on it now.
very sobering and beautiful film. Marmaduke's father, Milson's husband, Simon Waring, has very, very generously uh, agreed to come and contribute to the discussion tonight uh, and share his unique perspective as a carer. Please welcome Simon Waring. Thank you. Uh, I, am, I do have my phone because uh, one challenge I have tonight is the 10 minutes. So that's, that's probably going to help me. Um, and as you might understand, one of the other challenges may be um, maintaining my composure. So we'll see how we go. Um, I am just a parent. I'm not a medical professional. Um, I don't work for a medical organization or a, a hospital. So in that respect, this is a, a carer's perspective. Um, so what I would like to run through when I looked at what the evening was talking about was, well, what was palliative care to me and to us as a family? What did it allow us to do? And I think you hopefully got an indication of that um, through that very short film. And I suppose also a reflection on what I think helped make that happen. Um, so what was palliative care to me and to Milson? Um, I've written myself a note which actually says, um, dinosaurs, not Hitchcock. Um, so when Peter was talking about palliative care, um, we were very tentative to press the button. Um, the Hitchcock, sometimes if you mention palliative care, you almost feel this violin string is going to be starting off at the side of stage and it's, there's um, some grim stories. Whereas in fact for us, um, it wasn't dark cloaks or people surrounding um, the bedside in the last week. Um, we never saw a dark cloak. We saw, I saw a dinosaur tail. Um, I saw a palliative care nurse come up to my son's bedside wearing a dinosaur's tail because she knew that would bring laughter, comfort, a smile to someone who was in their last few weeks. Um, so that's my impression. Um, no gothic horror music, um, but compassion, um, attention, and amazing hard work. The reason we were hesitant to press the button, in part, was explained through the film. Uh, Milsom herself was terminal, um, so she was not necessarily in palliative care herself towards, um, until right at the end, but she was trying to get through chemo and hold the house together while I was doing a lot of the um, hospital work, but things were very exhausting. And palliative care, definitely there was hesitancy that if we actually embraced it, said, yep, let's press the palliative care button at the Royal Children's, I think it was very, uh, it was almost holding a mirror up to Milsom. Um, and so I got briefed. Um, I had lots of conversations with the palliative care team so that I was aware of what could be done. And then uh, when we needed to embrace it, we did. And so although the film talks about his last five weeks, um, that's because Milsom died um, five weeks before he did. They had a three year journey. Um, and then, as these things happen, no one could have expected it. They died within five weeks of each other. Milson went first. Um, but palliative care actually were involved with our family for five months of Marmaduke's life. So he relapsed. I won't go into major detail, but he relapsed um, perhaps 10 months uh, before he died. We were still looking for a cure in the first three months. When it became evident that that wasn't going to happen, that's when we decided, well, let's pull him off treatment, get him home, and enjoy the, the time that we had with him. Um, but even at that stage, palliative care weren't involved. Um, they were briefed probably at about five months in to his relapse, which effectively was five months before he died. And that's when the pain management became more of an issue. And so it was very, very subtly done. Um, they were an active part of the medical team. Um, not invisible, but subtly providing advice behind the scenes. 
probably at the four-month stage, I was sitting down with them, being introduced. Uh, we were talking about the sorts of um, equipment and options that you saw in the film. And it needed to be explained. It's very difficult as a, as a parent or a carer to even grasp what's going to be needed. Um, with hindsight, I can see my son. You can see on the film the tumors um, affecting his face. But that's literally, that was only in the last sort of four to five weeks. Um, the, the bulk of his treatment, um, yes, he went in and out. He, got, um, he lost weight, lost his hair. But he was just beaming and mischievous throughout. Um, so it's very difficult to make decisions, which is where the team is there to support you. And when buttons need to be pressed, it all happens. Um, so probably at three months, they became a lot more active in his care. And certainly in the last two months, that was the only way I could get him home, was with um, all the opioids we've been using at home. One night, it just all stopped working, raced him into hospital, and then he needed a subcut. That cut through the pain. The relief was palpable. You could see it on his face. But the only way to get him home then was with a, a driver. So then we needed uh, daily nurses coming in just to change the driver. But of course, there was no hesitation on our part then. We were... Um, we knew that that was what was going to work. So I think the last two months, is, it was an intense uh, and a hands-on relationship. We had a relationship um, with the Royal Children's. We had a relationship with uh, the regional palliative care nurses who came in each day. Um, when the wheels fell off for Milsom, um, she was uh, in at another hospital, and I was sort of juggling, racing in with Marmaduke, well, dropping the kids off at school, then racing in with Marmaduke in his pusher, because he'd got his broken leg, um, ringing the daily nurses to say, I'm not going to be there, I'm going to be at the Freemasons, then ringing the Royal Children's to say, we need some more daily drugs, and someone would be dropping what they're doing, jumping in a cab, um, this is what you don't see. Um, palliative care, what worked for us. There's a lot of unseen work behind the scenes, lots of people going the extra mile, and their focus was his comfort. And very grateful for that. What did palliative care allow us to do? Um, we hinted at that in the film. Um, it allowed us to have Marmaduke at home with his mum really important for her because she was limited, desperately important for him and cr critically important for his siblings, his sister and his brothers because over a three-year cancer journey, yes, cancer affects everyone in the family. Um, so for some of his brothers, the whole of their conscious life, the family unit was almost about everybody else. Dad was disappearing. Anyone who came to the door was a medical professional. Most conversations were about Marmaduke. Um, you try and have a normal life, but at the slightest whimper from the corner bedroom, everything gets dropped. So um, very important for the family to be involved and to have him at home. I think when I reflected on um, how palliative care assisted him, there's no, there's no clear answer, but I think what would be important to me or to anyone when you die, I think it would be to be loved or to know that you are loved, to be held, and to be comforted. And with the benefit of the palliative care support, he was able to have that. Um, and as Charlotte said in the film, um, when he, his energy finally declined in his last few weeks, there was not a moment, really, when he didn't have someone lying in the bed with him. Mop, not, not so much mopping his fevered brow. Often it might be changing a DVD for him, um, just stroking him, just giving him that contact. Um, and that is so, um, I can't under, um, I can't uh, explain just how important that was or it felt it, it was for him. Um, and it wasn't just support, he got joy and laughter. So palliative care gave him pain relief, that's critical. Um, in the film I say, it's the way the film's edited, it says, oh, palliative care is just comfort. Um, possibly, but it's on a holistic level. It's not just the pain, it's also the emotional comfort. The, um, what do I think, excuse me, Gail, I've just got to make sure my, uh, my stopwatch turned off. Um, very briefly, what do I think helped make this happen? Do I think this is a one-size-fits-all and that everyone should die at home? No, 
Um, you will see that in our circumstances, it was important to be at home uh, because of Milson, because she was dying, and because of the siblings. Um, what you don't see is that at one stage, um, I sat and had a vigil at the Royal Children's because it was all over, he was going. Um, none of the meds worked, and um, everyone said, he's, I'm, I'm sorry, he's gonna, he's gonna go tonight. And we actually canceled some additional operation, um, some radiotherapy at Peter Mac. I sat down, had the vigil. Um, children being children, um, Marmaduke woke up in the morning and opened his eyes and said, I'd like a baby Chino. Um, this is what happened. So for us, yes, it was great to have him at home. Um, I, I'd also made my peace that if he died in hospital, that would also be good because I knew he'd be surrounded by such wonderful staff. Um, so you can't be too rigid about these things. Um, however, do I think just being at home is what did it? Um, no. I think... Um, you can, you don't always choose the location, but I think you can influence the environment. So when Marmaduke was at home, um, we tried to show no fear on the surface. Um, there were no whispered conversations by his bed, uh, no furtive glances. We just embraced each moment, embraced the day. We went in with smiles and laughter and touch and compassion, and um, did we demand that his brothers and sister did the same? No, but if you um, demonstrate those actions, it's very natural for them to pick it up. Um, if you um, communicate lots of tension and anxiety, children are better at picking that up than anybody. Marmaduke would pick it up, but then so would his siblings. Um, the other component is, um, with hindsight, it sounds wonderful that we managed to have this beautiful time at home with him. Uh, you've got to remember, after a three-year cancer journey, everyone in the family was exhausted, physically and emotionally. Um, so without that palliative care support, it wouldn't have been possible. So um, a big thank you there. And palliative care isn't one person coming in each day just to check a driver. It might be a whole range of professionals interconnected to help the comfort. There are gonna be situations where someone may have a week or two weeks of palliative care. For Marmaduke, it was five months. For other children and possibly other adults, it may be a year or longer. So um, there's a lot more I could say, but I'm gonna be over time. So if I was going to finish, I would say, please don't underestimate how important it is for the family whether that's children, relatives, to be close physically to the person who is dying. Um, it absolutely helped Marmaduke, and I know that it has also helped the surviving siblings with their grief and their mental health afterwards, which is um, not something you necessarily think about at the time, but it's, that's what you see with hindsight. So, thank you. <laughs>